Everybody, this is important. If you're a sixth grade girl, you should be sitting in the front three rows right here. Move on up. Come on. If you're an eighth grade girl, you should be sitting in the front four rows right here. And if you're a seventh grade girl, you should be sitting in the front four rows right here. Guys, you sit behind the girls. Come on in. Make room. No screaming. Hey, guys, sixth grade guys, you might have to move back a row. Hey, Elise. Bring it to me, please. Where are all y'all's group at? For real? That's crazy. All right, if you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, stop talking. All right. I'm on a couple of a quick announcements for all you awesome, awesome people. If you're sitting in a chair and you're sharing that chair with someone else, we're going to ask you to spread out, which is what your leaders are doing right now. We don't want to be a distraction to anyone. If you're sitting in a row and you see a bunch of empty seats in front of you, you can move up. It's okay. It's all right to do that. All right, if you have a cell phone as you're moving around, as you're moving around, if you have a cell phone, you can go ahead and put that under your seat because you don't need it. All right, listen up. As y'all, uh oh, I dropped my notes. Oh, yeah. All right, I have a question. Does anybody know what this is? All right. All right, listen. A couple of things. We're going to go over a couple of house rules that you all need to be very aware of. Sometimes we may take for granted that everybody knows exactly the way that they're supposed to act. You know, sometimes we just we forget sometimes that people are new or they haven't been here before. And so I want to be super clear. Rick, can you shut those doors in the back? All right, so what we don't do is we don't jump high and try to not swat things or knock things or grab onto things, all right? We all know you're supreme athletes, and you can jump incredibly high, and you're strong and awesome, but because of that, we have a sign that's broken that we have to put back up, and so we don't want things to get broken, and so we would ask that you don't jump, you don't knock things down. You try to treat everything with a high level of respect, Okay. Here's the second thing. Does anybody know what PDA stands for? Public displays of affection. Now, let me be super clear. Listen up. There is absolutely no need for any boys and girls to be showing any affection to each other on the property of Fellowship Church. All right? Now, listen. Listen. Your parents can talk to you about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate for their liking. But here, there aren't going to be any hand-holding. We're not going to be sitting in worship and doing all that kind of stuff shoulder to shoulder and kind of, you know, doing pretend like this, you know, that, you know. No, we're not doing that. 
You don't want to be hanging out with just boys or just girls, right? We're here for a purpose, to build community and to know Jesus, all right? Here's the, here's the third thing that you need to know. Everything here, right? Yeah, put your cell phones under your chairs if you haven't done that yet because they're about to start taking them if you're not. So everything here in the building is here for a reason. So you notice there's pins in the back of your chairs. Anybody ever used one of those before? Right? Here, here, here's what you need to know. We have specific seating for y'all because, no offense, but the middle school group is usually the one that tends to kind of take the pins apart or maybe chew on them or maybe, yeah, I know you're like, oh, my gosh, who would do that, right? We know. Some people do. But here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. There's papers in the front of your seat. They're called connection cards, right? Listen, every single week someone comes to this church places those pins, and places those connection cards so that we can have them there on Sundays so that people that are new to our church can connect and talk to us about, hey, I need prayer. I want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus. I want to know more about Fellowship Church. That's how they communicate with us. So if y'all are messing with those papers and messing with those pins, it makes someone else's job ten times harder. So those are not there for you. Those papers are not there for you. You may not want to pay attention. And that's okay, but you need to, to be, be quiet, and you can draw on your paper if you want to. And here's the last thing. Climbing over chairs, jumping around, all that kind of stuff, like, that's not allowed. I'm 90% sure that most of your parents wouldn't let you jump on the couch with your shoes, right? My parents would. I don't care about you, the 10%. I'm not asking that, right? Don't put your feet on the furniture, all right? Just do the way you're supposed to do and leave the things that aren't supposed to be, that aren't there for you. Leave them alone. All right, here's the very last thing, I promise. Some of you are here because you have to be, because your parents make you be here. And that's okay with me. I'm glad that you're here. Some of you are here because you get a free piece of pizza and maybe two or chicken nuggets, whatever you're looking for. Some of you are here because you really want to learn and grow in what it means to follow Jesus. We're glad every single person is here. But here's what we're not going to be able to allow. And you all know this, and you have all heard this, but I need you to hear it again in this room right now, especially the the guys, no offense, right? If you're being a distraction to someone else, if you're not able to, to, to participate in the way that we expect you to participate, and I love you, but you're not going to be able to be in the room, right? And we're going to have to let your parents know that. Hey, we want them here. But they can't participate properly, and so they can't be here. Or you have to be here with them, right? That's what the rule is. So you get to sit next to your mom on Wednesday nights, which would be weird, unless your mom's serving, by the way, not weird. That's awesome. Uh, (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) If they're here because you can't behave, how about that? Um, And this is what else I know, by the way. Let me tell you what else I know. I know that we all are growing in what it means to be be, uh, mature, and know and understand how to act. So we're not going to kick you out just for doing one thing. That's not what I'm saying. But we ask that you would say, hey, I understand that I'm stepping into a different type of ministry, right? It's a little more uh, expected out of you. And I know you can do it, by the way. I know that everyone in this room can participate and be a part of what we're doing here and the reason that we're here. Right? Am I right? No? Am I right? Yeah! Yeah. All right, I appreciate you all hearing that. Um, hey, so next Wednesday, what are y'all doing? Who said Beast Feast? Yes. Food pantry. Food pantry, right? Next week, the middle schoolers are bringing the heat and bringing food pantry so we can stock the pantry at the Fellowship Center. That is our Go Week mission project, all right? You're also going to have some stuff to do in your small groups that are going to go along with that. So it's going to be a great time. Every year... We want to step in to missions as a student ministry because guess what? You're supposed to say what? We are the church. You are the church. You're not just students in student ministry. You're not just here on Wednesdays. You're a part of the life of Fellowship Church. And we want to treat you like you're a part of the life of Fellowship Church. And so we want to make sure that we're on mission together because that's what we do at Fellowship Church. All right? All right. So we're going to go and jump in. Who was here at the Luau last week? 
You know what? I'm so impressed by y'all, first of all. Thank you. I was, it was a lot of fun. I sweated a lot. Uh, yeah. I don't know why. Yeah, you got the hat. Who else got a hat? Yeah? So we do have some more hats, by the way, in case you want one. They're going to be outside after. They're 10 bucks. Um, I think that's cheap, by the way, for these hats. Yeah, that's cheap. And we, and we, uh, that's, that's what we paid for them. So we're not making any money off of anything like that. So, so last week we started a new series called Back to Basics. And does anybody remember the question I asked last week? Come on. What is a Christian? Right? What is a Christian? And here, just like we want to make sure that we don't Take for granted the fact that some of you may not know the rules on Wednesday nights, or you may not remember the rules on Wednesday nights. We want to encourage and make sure that we don't overthink and overstep the idea that some of you may not know some of the basics of Christianity. And that's okay, because we want you to know what it means to be a Christian. And then this week, we're talking about the idea of who are you? Or the better question you can ask is, who am I? So we're going to talk about what it looks like from the Bible to answer the question, who are you? But first, before we do that, I want you to answer the question, who are you? So everybody should have a paper or a notebook. Turn your paper over. And I want you to write down, you're going to have 73 seconds to write down, who are you? Go. I think you still have like 20 seconds. Is anybody still going? All right, you got more time. Keep it up. You got my, I'm going to tell you when you have 10 seconds left. Shh, it's okay. Hmm. All right, 10 seconds. And time. It's okay. You can keep going while I talk. All right. Who wrote down, I am, and then they wrote their name? Yep. Yep. I, hey, I'm not hating. I'm not hating. I'm just saying. You, so, so would you say that that's all you are is your name? All right. I'm going to tell you a really corny joke because I have time to. There's this movie. It's actually a book. It's called The Lord of the Rings. It's the greatest thing ever. It's the greatest thing ever written. The greatest cinematic production ever. All right, listen. So you might need to know this. That Legolos, anybody know who Legolos is? He's the elf archer, amazing character. He actually looks very different in the books than he does in the movies. Right? I don't have pictures for you, but can anybody picture Orlando Bloom? Right, he is plays Legolas in the movies. Yeah, and so he's got blonde hair and he's beautiful and he's got a bow and arrow and he's got these two knives and he's awesome. But the joke is, and I laughed out loud, it says, this is what he looks like in the movies. It shows a picture of him. It says, this is what he looks like in the books. And it shows the word, like just the letters, Legolas. He gets it. All right, I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was funny. But here's why I bring that up. Here's why I bring that up. All right, all right. So, so here is the truth. We are more than just our names. And just like the character of Legolos is more than the letters on the page, as depicted in the movies, we are more than our name. And so someone up front said, I am a follower of Christ. I say amen to that, right? And some of, else, oh, uh, some of you others might have written that as well. Some of you might have written, 
I'm a cheerleader. I'm a brother. I'm a sister. I'm a track star. I'm whatever, right? There's all kind of things you might have written down about yourself. But here's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about who does the Bible say that we are. And it's important that you know this. This is some of the basics of Christianity. And so what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into it, and we're going to fill in these blanks for you. And so at the very top it says, we are all, and the first blank is, born in sin. And you're like, what? Every scripture verse, I want you to keep those papers and go in. You might have looked at them in your small groups, okay? But it explains our nature is sin. Our bent is sin. We are born in sin. All right? And the next one is, even a little bit more harsh sounding, we are dead in sin. Right? Somebody said, uh-oh, that's right. So oftentimes people will talk about sin and the result of sin as a sickness or a wound or something that needs to be fixed, but it's actually described as something that needs to be completely transformed and changed in us. We are dead, and then in Christ we can be made alive, which we'll talk about in just a little while. Here's another one that's tough to hear. We are children of wrath. You're like, man, really bringing it up the hard stuff today on this Wednesday. But it's true. In Ephesians, it tells us that we are children of wrath. God has wrath against sin, and we are sinners. And so it actually says that we stand condemned already in another part of Scripture. And also we are enemies of God. Right. It's like this is tough, but it's true. Well, let me say this. If you trust what Scripture says and believe that it's the Word of God, it's what it tells us about ourselves. Who are we? We are enemies of God. We are lost. We are sinners. And there's a penalty for sin. There's this word for, for uh, when you go against the direction of the king and you defy the king of a country, and it's called treason. And sin is treason against the king of the universe, who is God. Cosmic treason is what someone said to me one time, and I was like, I can get behind that. But there's also another way that we're described in Scripture. So it says we are also made in the image of God. We're the only creatures in all of creation that are made in the image of God, which is great news because that gives us value innately. It gives us value in who we are and how we are created. And because we are created in the image of God, God places a high value on us. But we're also made to glorify God. We are made to give God glory. And because we don't do that in sin, we are not operating in who we are made to be. Also says we are known by God, which is crazy, by the way, because God literally created everything. I was at the beach over the weekend, and I always think as I look out over the ocean, I think this, that never ends. Have you ever had that thought before? Like, especially if you ever go out on a boat deep out into the ocean, you look around and you see nothing but the ocean. And you're like, this is endless. This will go on forever. But in reality, God created that with a word. And he holds it in the palm of his hand even. Actually, the whole world he sustains in the palm of his hand. And that same God who created the endless ocean knows you. He knows everything about you. He specifically made you. It says in Psalms 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That goes back to the idea that God created us and he knows us and he made us wonderful. And the created for a purpose is the last thing. So we know we're made to glorify God. But we also know that God sets good works out for us to do that he prepared in advance for us as Christians as those who follow Jesus. And here's what's awesome about God. You might be thinking, how can we be made in the image of God 
and be an enemy of God at the same time? How can we be known by God and be children of wrath at the same time? And the reality of it is God is so good and He's so merciful and He's so kind to us that He creates us knowing that we will rebel against Him. He loves us so much that He still creates us and gives us this opportunity to repent, which we're going to talk about that word in just a second. As a matter of fact, if you really want to get crazy, when God spoke the world into existence, which He didn't have to do, He knew in that moment, in fact, in every moment for all of eternity, that creating humanity would cause the need for Jesus to die on the cross, His one and only Son. But He loved us enough to create us anyway. That's mind-blowing if you ask me. So God knows we're going to rebel. He loves us, creates us in His image. Because of our sin, it's not God's character that makes us enemies of God. It's our character. It's our sin that separates us from God. And Scripture says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you might be thinking, well, I'm not an enemy of God. And you may not be. We'll talk about that in a second as well. But there is this truth that apart from Christ, we are all the same. We are all separate from God because of our sin. But there's good news, and that's what the gospel is. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, so Jesus steps in the, on the scene, and he says, I know that because of your sin, that you are an enemy of God, that you are separated from God, and you are sitting under the wrath of God, I'm going to make a way for you to be right with God, for you to no longer be an enemy of God, but for you to be actually part of the family of God. And see, now when we are all made in the image of God, we are not all part of God's family until we are adopted in to God's family through the life and death of Jesus Christ. And so there's a thing called the great exchange. You've heard us talk about it from stage a lot. It's this idea that Jesus takes our life and gives us his life. And it's a wonderful truth that he would say, I know that I must die to pay the penalty for your sin. And I'm going to freely step into that and offer you this chance for repentance. And I want to read something to you from Second Peter. It's one of my favorite scriptures of all time. And it says this, starting in verse 8. So 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the Lord, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that should all should reach repentance. A word that is used in scripture in some translations it says long suffering. God desires that all people would come to repentance and would come to salvation. God puts up with us, in the best way I can say it, for a long time so that we can see the opportunity to repent. Repentance means to turn away from one thing and turn towards another. That's what repentance means. And so God puts up with us. He's patient with, with us, not wishing that anyone would perish. But what that means and what we need to understand is that there are those who are perishing. And that's like a hard concept sometimes to have as a 12 or 13 or 14 year old is the fact that because of our sin, we are actually, well, perished would be the word. Like we are lost in sin, separate from God and deserving of just punishment. That's part of the gospel. The good news is, is that we're all sinners deserving of punishment, but Jesus came to pay that penalty for us. Actually, it says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It says that in Romans 10, 13. Not some or not a few 
but all who call upon the name of the Lord. And so this idea of who are you has to do with Scripture says who you are. We're lost. We're separated from God. But we're also at the same time loved by God and cared for by God. But in Christ, we become children of God. And then we no longer are enemies of God. We are friends of God. We are no longer dead in sin. We're alive in Christ. So in Christ, he transforms us and changes us and does not leave us where we were and saves us. That's where that word saved comes from. Jesus saves us from the death of sin and gives us new life in him. So Jesus steps on the cross and says, on this cross, I'm going to pay the penalty and die the death that you and I should have died because of our sin. Remember, there's a penalty for sin. There's a consequence for sin. Cosmic treason against the ruler of the universe. But he also says, I lived this perfect life that you couldn't live, and I'm going to give that to you as well. So now, instead of being dead in our sin, we're alive in Christ. Instead of being children of wrath, we're children of God. Instead of being enemies of God, we're friends of God. But there must be a decision and a step for you. You have to make a decision. Do you want to continue to live who you are without Christ? Or do you want to step into new life in Christ and, be that, and that be who you are? Because you cannot be this person and this person. Because in order to come to a place of faith in Christ, you have to give up your old life. That's what he calls us to. And we don't know what that looks like exactly. You can't say like, I, you can't ask me the question of like, well, if I say yes to Jesus, what does that mean for the rest of my life? I don't know. He may ask you to do way different things than he asked me to do. But I know he asks us to follow him, to trust him, to love others, to forgive others, to be gentle, to be patient, to be kind, to be loving. All those things I can tell you, but what that's going to look like in your day-to-day -day life, I don't know. It could be different than what it was for me. I know it's different for some of you than it is for me, depending on your home life, depending on your school life, depending on your friends. But man, to know who you are in Christ, that last song we sang in worship, it says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. And when God says that we are free in Christ, we are free. And some of you might say, I've already made this decision. I know that I belong to Christ. I know that he's mine. I know that I'm his. But there's a good chance that you need to step into repentance for something that's going on in your life right now and turn back to him. You may just step into a place of going like, God, I don't know why I keep doing this thing, but I want to stop doing it. I want to give it to you. I want to turn away from it. I want to chase after you. And you may need to talk to someone about that. You may need to talk with a leader. You may need to talk with your parents about that. I don't know where you are in your relationship with Jesus. But I know this, if you would say who I am is not who Jesus says I am, then you have two decisions to make. Do you want to become who Jesus says you are in him? Do you want to be adopted into the family of God and be an heir, a co-heir with Christ in the promises of God? All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone who asks he loves you that much. He loves you so much that he created you knowing you were going to sin and rebel against him and be his enemy, and he was going to send his son to die for you so you might have the opportunity to respond. It's the best news ever. And maybe you're sitting here and you're going, I am this, but I'm not living like it. Well, then it's okay. Repent and surrender. God's mercy, Lord's mercies are new every day. It says in Scripture where sin abounds, where there's a lot of sin, grace abounds more. We cannot out -sin God's grace. Sometimes it feels like we can, by the way. Sometimes it feels like we are out -sinning God's grace and we feel like God's going to get tired of me. But he's not because he loves us. And he says, you are mine. That's who you are now. And his grace and his mercies are overflowing towards you, and they will never run out. But you need to live like it and walk like it. If God says you're free, be free. And it's a learning of how it looks to live free, by the way. But some of you need to decide today, who are you going to be? Are you going to be who God says you are? Or are you going to be who you say you are? Jesus is 
ready and waiting for you to turn to him and turn away from yourself. And the opportunity is there for you. So we're going to pray in just a second. But I want to ask you, if you don't know that you belong to Jesus, the question is, how are you going to respond to the invitation of Jesus? Because he's inviting you in. It says in Scripture that he knocks and he waits for us to answer. I always wondered, I got saved when I was 32 years old, I always wondered, would God have sa- could God have saved me at 25 or would he have saved me at 45 if I would have waited? I don't know the answer, but I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. Like God desires that all would come to repentance. So he's constantly offering to you this call. And the question is, how are you going to respond to that call? Either do you want to be saved and give your life to Christ, or are you ready to repent and follow him uh, as a follower of Christ, turn away from your sin and continue to pursue him more and more? And so I'm going to really challenge you. to. to you're going to have a few minutes to find a leader, ask a question, don't be afraid. Like, we are here because we want you to know what it looks like to follow after Jesus with everything. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you for your word, that you would show us who we are. God, we know that scripture is a mirror that shows us who we are, God. I pray that students in this room would know that they belong to you, Those that do know that already, God, that they would recognize there's things they need to repent and turn away from. They would seek help. They would seek a leader. They would would talk through what it looks like to kill that sin and to follow you more. And God, I know there's students in this room who don't know what it means to follow you. Who would say, I don't even understand what it looks like to follow Jesus. God, we want to help them walk that out. I pray that they would seek out a leader and have that conversation. I thank you for every leader in the room. I thank you for the truth of your word and the sacrifice of your son Jesus, that he would die for our sins and he would live the life that we couldn't live. We love you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.